Welcome to a moderated discussion with Dr. W. Caleb McDaniel, author of Sweet Taste of Liberty, A True Story of Slavery and Restitution in America. My name is Haya Panjwani, and I am the MC for today's event. I'm currently a student at the University of Houston, majoring in political science and journalism. Today's program is entitled, The Conversations on Truth, Freedom, and Justice and is proudly being presented to you by the Ismaili Jamathkana and Center. Through the guidance of His Highness the Aga Khan, the 49th hereditary Imam of the Shia Ismaili Muslims, the Ismaili Jamathkanas in the United States are positioned to be more than places of worship and spiritual search. They are places of friendship, dialogue, and inclusivity, reaching out to neighbors to facilitate an exchange of ideas. This is achieved through hosting cultural programs such as educational seminars and lectures, art exhibitions, music and dance, and as a forum for civic leaders and others. At the opening ceremony of the new headquarters of the Global Center for Pluralism on May 16, 2017, the Aga Khan explained, and I quote, Pluralism does not mean the elimination of difference, but the embrace of difference. Genuine pluralism understands that diversity does not weaken society, it strengthens it. In an ever-shrinking, ever more diverse world, a genuine sense of pluralism is the indispensable foundation for human peace and progress." End quote. These spaces hope to encourage community engagement and collaboration on issues of concern, as well as broadening intellectual horizons and fostering an appreciation of pluralism. Today is no exception, as we are pleased to present a moderated discussion with Dr. W. Caleb McDaniel. Dr. McDaniel is an author, professor, and the chair of the history department at Rice University. He also serves as the co-chair for Rice's, Rice University's task force on slavery, segregation, and racial injustice. Dr. McDaniel's most recent book, which is the topic of today's discussion, is entitled Sweet Taste of Liberty, A True Story of Slavery and Restitution in America, and is the 2020 recipient of the Pulitzer Prize Award for History. The book chronicles the life of Henrietta Wood, a woman who was born enslaved, freed before the Civil War, kidnapped and re-enslaved, and then freed again by the war. In 1870, she sued her kidnapper in federal court, and in a rare case of restitution, a jury awarded her $2,500. Today's discussion will be moderated by Dr. Neelam Koja. Dr. Koja is a postdoctorate fellow at Yale University and a graduate of Harvard University with a research focus on historically marginalized communities. Without further ado, please enjoy the discussion. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And I would like to personally thank the Aga Khan Council for Southwestern USA, and especially Dr. Caleb McDaniel. His book, Sweet Li A Taste of Sweet Liberty, has encaptured me for the past two weeks. I've read it, I've thought about it a lot. I have a lot of questions and a lot of different themes that I would like to explore with him. So it is my privilege and my honor to welcome him in this conversation today. Thank you for your time and especially thank you for this wonderfully, beautifully written book. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you for having me and been looking forward to talking with you about it. So to get us going, I think a lot of our audience probably hasn't had the opportunity and the joy of reading the book yet. So just to get us all situated, can you give us a brief overview of who Henrietta Wood is, who um, Zebulon Ward was, and what brought the two of them together? Sure, so Sweet Taste of Liberty is a subtitled A True Story of Slavery and Restitution in America. And it follows the story of a woman named Henrietta Wood, who I first learned about in the fall of 2014 when I read an interview that she gave in a small town Ohio newspaper in 1879. And in that interview, she told the story about how while living as a free woman in Cincinnati, Ohio, before the Civil War, uh, 
she was kidnapped and enslaved by a man named Zebulon Ward, who was actually a deputy sheriff in Kentucky at the time, just across the Ohio River from Cincinnati, where Wood lived. As a 19th century American historian, uh, it was not sadly surprising to me to learn of the kidnapping of a free black woman into the domestic slave trade. This happened uh, quite commonly and, and historians now believe that perhaps as many people were kidnapped from the lower north into the upper south as managed to escape in the other direction on the well-known underground railroad. And so although that was not surprising to me to learn that a woman like Wood might have found herself in the clutches of a man like Zebulon Ward, what did surprise me was the way that her story ended because after the Civil War in um, 1870, she had managed to return to Cincinnati after a very long ordeal that took her to Mississippi and also to Texas during the war itself. And she filed a lawsuit against Zebulon Ward. The case ultimately was heard before a federal court. And in the end, after many years of litigation, she managed to win a judgment against Ward in the amount of $2,500, which is the largest known sum of restitution ever paid by a United States court to a formerly enslaved person uh, in American history. And so that's the story in brief of Henrietta Wood and uh, reading that in the fall of 2014 immediately uh, captivated my attention and sent me on a long search for as much as I could find about Wood and Ward in order to write this book. I think one of the most captivating things was this idea of how their lives are so entangled across such a vast geography, right? They cross so many different states and yet somehow they kind of come together again and again. And a lot of it is because of the legal actions that Henrietta Wood is able to take. Um, I wanted to kind of um, delve out a little bit more of the details of what even led to the first lawsuit that Henrietta Wood had against Ward. So can you give us a little bit of a background on that? Sure. Um, and, you know, I learned more as, as I did more research about the full span of her life as well, because the interview that I mentioned where I first read about her story began with her kidnapping. And so it wasn't until about a year later that I was able to fill out some of the more, uh, some of the details about the rest of her life. She, I learned that she was actually born enslaved in Kentucky around 1818 or 1820. Um, she was at that time owned by a family known as the Towsies. Moses Towsey was a farmer in Northern Kentucky who enslaved Wood's mother. And so according to the laws of the state of Kentucky at the time, uh, any child born to an enslaved mother would also be enslaved. And so Wood lived uh, until she was about 14 on the, the Towsey's farm. But then when Moses Towsey died, she was sold away from her family and separated from them for the first time. So in terms of geography, um, even before she ever, uh, her, her life ever intersected with Wards, she uh, was taken down the Mississippi River to New Orleans, Louisiana, you know, hundreds of miles away from, from where she had lived as a child and, and from her family. And she worked and lived there for about six or seven years um, in, in enslaved by a man named William Sirod, mm -hmm. who was a merchant there in New Orleans. But ultimately, um, William Sirod returned to France. He was a French immigrant and um, he fled some creditors in the city of New Orleans who were trying to make him pay some debts in court. Uh, and so he, uh, he fled, he left the country and went back to France. And that was a key turning point in Wood's life because Sirode's wife, Jane Sirode, uh, was left behind um, and uh, remained in control of uh, some of the people that the family had enslaved, including Wood. She returned to Kentucky with Wood and later moved to Cincinnati, Ohio. And so in, in 1848, uh, Wood made that fateful crossing of the Ohio River uh, and became a, a free woman in Cincinnati, a state where the laws were quite different from the laws in Kentucky where she was born. 
uh, in Ohio, slavery had been outlawed by the state's constitution from its earliest years. And uh, she was required to register as a free person if she wanted to be employed in, in Cincinnati. And so uh, in 1848, she later remembered receiving uh, official freedom papers that certified that she was uh, a free woman. And she later referred to that period of her life in Cincinnati as her sweet taste of liberty. That's the, the origin of the title of the book. Um, for the first time, she understood what it meant to, to, uh, to be a free woman uh, and not to, um, not to see you know, slave sales happening in the streets as they would have in, in New Orleans or in the places she had lived in Kentucky. But at the same time, her freedom was precarious. And I think it's telling that she referred to those years as a taste of liberty because she still was doing the same kinds of work that she would have done while enslaved to the Sarodes uh, in New Orleans. She was working for very low wages or no wages at all in boarding houses and families in Cincinnati doing domestic work. Um, and because she lived so close still to a state like Kentucky where slavery was legal, uh, she and, and other free people living in Cincinnati at the time were always in danger of being kidnapped and re-enslaved. And that's exactly what happened to her in, in 1853, only five years after she had obtained her freedom in Cincinnati. Right. So can you tell us a little bit more about Zebulon Ward and his background? Um, what, why, why was he the kind of prime person whom Henry, Henrietta Wood could have sued? So as you say, the, there was two fateful crossings in my mind. The first was when she first gained freedom. And the second is when she is, without her knowledge, taken back downriver, back into Kentucky, and then sold into slavery yet again. Mm -hmm. um, and here, Ward plays quite an interesting role, not just as the person who purchases her, probably knowing very well that she was a freed woman, but also someone who makes a mark on slavery in a much different way, and that is through the prison system. So if you could please give a background on, on that. Sure, sure. So um, Ward had actually been born in, in Kentucky um, not very far from, from where Wood was born, but of course, um, he lived a very different life, um, you know, as a white man in Kentucky, as a citizen of the state, um, as somebody who could pursue in a way his own version of the American dream, you know, to try to, um, get rich quick. Uh, and, and he, he did that in a variety of ways, um, before 1853, he had worked on steamboats on the Mississippi river. He had participated in the California gold rush. Um, he was uh, he sort of dabbled in, in a variety of, of different commercial enterprises. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, he had become a deputy sheriff mm. in Covington, Kentucky, the sort of sister city to Cincinnati, right across the Ohio River. Um, and by that time he had, he had married and, and started a family, um, had begun to acquire enslaved people of his own. But I think when he heard about the possibility of, of uh, taking control of wood, um, he saw it as another way to get rich quick. Uh, mm -hmm. If he could kidnap wood, if he could bring her across the river, if he could sell her quickly to one of the many professional slave trading firms that uh, was operating in Kentucky at that time, then he stood to, to reap a, a gigantic profit uh, from, from doing that. Um, what he didn't count on was Wood being courageous enough to uh, talk about what happened to her. And so after that second crossing that you mentioned, when she was lured into a carriage and taken across the Ohio River, um, within hours of her kidnapping, she had started to to talk to anyone who was sympathetic or seemed sympathetic to her about how she was a free woman, uh, that she she was not uh, legally uh, enslaved in Kentucky, that she had been wrongfully brought into the state, that she had been wrongfully enslaved. And because of that, there was a freedom suit that was uh, filed against Zebulon Ward in Kentucky uh, in, in the 1850s that ultimately Ward won, partly because those freedom papers that I mentioned earlier, um, the kidnappers had managed to, to steal uh, 
the only existing copy of those papers. And so um, the court ruled in his favor. And uh, that's partly because, as you mentioned earlier, by that time, you know, he was a, a fairly prominent man in Kentucky. Um, he had gone from being a sort of um, upwardly mobile, you know, trying to, to engage in all kinds of get rich quick schemes to somebody who was an officer of the law and who in 1854 was selected to be the manager of Kentucky's state penitentiary. So by the time uh, he won this judgment demonstrating that in the eyes of the, the state of Kentucky, Wood belonged to Ward, by that time he had taken over the, the state prison system in Kentucky. And so he was, um, you know, not just any um, white Kentuckian, but also a very well-connected and increasingly wealthy man who profited not just from the enslaved people he owned, but also from the exploitation of prisoners who were working in this state penitentiary. He was an architect of uh, the convict leasing or convict labor system that later spread to many states across the country, um, partly because he, after the Civil War, uh, um, assisted in implementing it in other states as well. He managed the state penitentiary in Tennessee for a time and also in Arkansas and really showed why it could be so lucrative for a private contractor to take over uh, a state prison system and force the prisoners to work uh, for his own profit. That's exactly what he did and why he had become very wealthy by the time they met in court again after the Civil War. Um, and even though he had won this earlier case against Wood in the 1870s, in the second case, Wood ultimately prevailed. Yeah. I do think it's interesting that the the um, verdict for the first case ironically becomes the reason why she wins the appeals in the second case. And I think that's such it's nice justice, at least in that sense. Um, but before we continue on with the story of Henrietta Wood and what happens to her when she's enslaved for a second time, I want to talk about things uh, like larger sort of ideas about genealogy and family history and belonging. I think what was struck what struck me a lot was in the conversation about her second her kidnapping and then her reenslavement was the question of where are you from, right? And you do such a beautiful job of trying to piece that out for enslaved peoples. This idea that they're being, that they are robbed of an identity. Most don't, didn't even know who their father was. A lot of times children were taken from their mothers, so they never had the um, love and the care and just general well, you know, being nurtured, even suckled by their own mothers. Um, the, 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 um, on the, on the, on the side of who the father is, of course, is, is very, um, you know, it's unknown. The mm -hmm. fact that slaves can legally married, of course, added to this, the fact that they were, you know, separated and sold off as, as separate units, of course, mm -hmm. mattered. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how does a historian piece together a history where there's so many silences? There's silences of genealogy, there's silences of, you know, um, we we hear very little about Henrietta Wood and how she was feeling most of the time, right? You do a beautiful job of piecing that together with, you know, through an empathetic lens of trying to say like, she might have felt this or she might have felt that, right? But we don't actually know. She didn't leave a memoir for us. You have to kind of piece it together. So I'm wondering as your task as a historian, how did you do this? What were the things that you had to rely on to flesh out the very skeletal, outline of her narrative. Thanks for that question. Uh, and, I, and I think it gets to the heart of, um, of slavery as a system of, of domination and, and power. You're right that the, the records that um, slaveholders kept and wanted to have kept in the antebellum period were not the kinds of records that would have preserved the sorts of things that historians would most want to know about enslaved people, who they're their family ties were, what they were feeling at particular moments of time. Um, and, and that was very much by design. You know, I mentioned earlier that the, the laws of the state of Kentucky 
held that any anyone born to an enslaved mother would also be enslaved. And because that's the way the, the system was set up, as you mentioned, the, the paternity of, of an enslaved person was not uh, always important for um, for record keeping purposes in from the perspective of, of slaveholders uh, like Ward. All that, that mattered was um, who the mother of, of the child was. And so it does create challenges for any genealogist or any historian who's trying to, to reconstruct uh, a particular in, enslaved woman's life. And I think uh, grappling with that is an, is an important way to see uh, what slavery did and, and, and how it, it dominated um, the, the lives of people who, who were enslaved, uh, that you know, the, the archive is itself an artifact of the power that uh, slaveholders exerted through the legal system uh, in this period. But I, I think that uh, against that silencing, there were always uh, efforts by enslaved people to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a determination to, um, to keep their own memories alive of, of their family relationships. And, and Wood's a great example of that. You know, she uh, remembered her parents' names and passed those names down to her descendants. And of course, she, as I mentioned earlier, had the courage to speak about what happened to her after her kidnapping and then also to go to court uh, after the war and and swear her her affidavit, her story of what happened. And then she gave, um, in addition to the first interview that I that I mentioned, she gave a second interview as well mm -hmm. to another newspaper reporter in uh, Ohio in the 1870s. And so those interviews were were crucial to me as as a historian because they gave a, a glimpse into her own uh, way of telling the story of her life not a perfect uh, lens by any means because she was prevented throughout her life from, from being taught how to read or write. Mm -hmm. So she couldn't commit her story to paper uh, in a memoir of her own, but she did speak with these newspaper reporters who uh, wrote down w what she said. And, and in the book, I explore some of the reasons for, for, um, having a lot of confidence in, in her memories. Uh, there's a, other sources that can corroborate what she said in those interviews that uh, can demonstrate that, that they do represent uh, to some extent her own, uh, her own words and her own memories. And so for me, it was a process of using those interviews as, as sort of a, a launching pad or a, a, a Rosetta Stone, if you, if you will, um, with which to understand the other sources that come from these very fragmentary archives uh, where she appears in the record more as, um, as a commodity than as, as a person, uh, you know, and I think trying to, to reconstruct her life uh, as, a, as a person and, and not only as the property of, of Zebulon Ward or William Sorot or Gerard Brandon, another man who, who claimed her as, as his property um, is, is the challenge that that any historian of of an enslaved person faces? Um, but you're you're right that it's it's uh, it's a challenging task, and certainly uh, I wouldn't want to to claim that it's a, a, a finished story or or one that um, that might not be told a different way by someone else looking at the same sources, because it requires a certain amount of of filling in the gaps, of reading against the grain. Uh, of trying to take everything that we know or can learn from the larger uh, archive of, of enslaved people and memoirs that we do have by, by formerly enslaved people and then using that to, right. to uh, try to um, read between the lines of what we do have about Wood and, and draw some tentative conclusions about what she might have felt at particular moments in time. Yeah. I want to get back to this idea of commodity and using slaves as, you know, they, at some point in the book, you mentioned that slaves are worth $3 billion, which was more than the infrastructure in place, any other economic activity that the United States at the time could have, you know, um, accounted for. And again, tying it back to this idea of silence and silencing others. Um, you know, when in the Ismaili community, one of the ethics of our faith 
teaches us to respect all humans with dignity, you know, give human dignity, like human dignity is a big value for us. You treat every person with respect and dignity. What's interesting as you read this is that in the mind of the slaveholder and in the mind of the pro-slavery, um, you know, that ideology, they are not human. Mm -hmm. And so it's difficult to kind of wrap your head around there's this entire ideology and practice and it's institutionalized to the point where they are a commodity. They are to stay silent, right? Even in the first, um, in the first lawsuit, in the first court case, Mm -hmm. She she describes herself in the in one of the interviews as sitting as stick like like a stick right like an inanimate object, and then in this after she wins the second case, when a reporter looks at her to gauge her reaction, he says that she's like a marble statue right both inanimate objects, mm -hmm. as if even then she has been freed, you know even then there is this idea of not being fully human. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I want to like kind of talk about this. So what does it mean to have so much wealth accumulated in slavery and 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 then the steps that one could take? So emancipation, I think you do a very great job in the book of showing the layers of emancipation, the long emancipation, as some scholars have, mm -hmm. you know, talked about this time in history, how long it took the states to actually ratify the amendments that were required to, you know, come back into the United States and at, with the recognition that slavery was to be abolished. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just thinking about all of this, I'm, I'm really curious to talk about how do we, you know, Reparations is one thing, and she definitely was a beneficiary, and so were her progeny. So did Arthur mm -hmm. Sims, and then his children and grandchildren, they benefited from this. But on the other hand, that ideology of the dehumanizing of mm -hmm. Black people persists, it persisted, and it continues to persist, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we battle that? What do we do about the silencing of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot there uh, to think about. I think you know you you captured well one of the the central facts about slavery that it involved the the commodification of of uh, of a human being and and all of the the paradoxes and and contradictions that that uh, that that resulted in um, you know and also I think you hinted at the fact that in the American context even though slavery is an ancient institution and, and appears in many world cultures. Uh, in the United States, it was a racialized in institution as well. And so um, what one Supreme Court justice later called the badges and incidents of slavery continued to attach after emancipation to, uh, to African Americans, uh, to black people in the United States um, because of the, the, um, the way that slavery was understood as a racial system in in the antebellum period, and so Woods' life, I think, exemplifies that that larger uh, phenomenon. Uh, you know, I think that when we think about slaveholders like like Zebulon Ward and the laws of of uh, antebellum states, there was always sort of a um, a contradiction in the law itself. You know, there were laws that that recognized enslaved people as property that could be bought and sold, that could be passed on as an inheritance to to uh, white descendants, um, as even even property that could be used to secure a mortgage. You know, things that might be um, difficult for us to 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 grapple with or think about today. Um, but at the same time, other laws. You know, acknowledged that uh, that enslaved people were people. You know that that had children, that had uh, family relationships, that um, you know could even be um, held accountable for for murder in some cases. You know, in some states. And so historians of the period have have tried to think about uh, what does it mean to have a legal system that that treated people as property. Uh, and then at the same time, in other contexts, treated property as, as people. Uh, the historian Walter Johnson refers to en enslaved people in this period as people with a price and all of the, the, the paradoxes that that entailed. You know, in Wood's case, when she has this lawsuit in the 1850s attempting to demonstrate that she was free, 
uh, the laws of the state of Kentucky, you know, think about it. How could a, how could somebody who was considered property bring a lawsuit before a court and sue to demonstrate that they were free? Well, there were there were sort of legal fictions at the time that held that if a person claimed that they were wrongfully enslaved, that they were actually a free person who had been deprived of their freedom and, and was being wrongly treated as property, they could sue. Uh, but if the court found against them and found that they were actually uh, enslaved, well, then they were property, so they couldn't have brought a suit to begin with. And so the case was just dismissed, just wiped from the, the record. And I think that's indicative of the uh, the contradictions, you know, that you were speaking about. Um, and I think you're, you're absolutely right that a, that a system that contorted, uh, you know, a system that, that went to such great lengths to deny the humanity of people of African descent um, was not a system that could be done undone uh, overnight uh, or whose consequences could be easily repaired or addressed. Uh, and certainly one of the things I hope that the readers of Wood's story will think about is what it, what it would take to, to redress uh, a, a crime as extensive as, as the system of slavery in, in the United States. I think it, at least one part of that repair would include uh, um, reckoning with, with what happened and, and talking truthfully about what happened as we have, I, I hope, been doing here, you know, trying to um, to reconstruct as best we can the, the human lived experience of people who went through that that system. Um, it's, it is partly about money when, when we're talking about reparations and certainly Wood, when she sued Ward, uh, was was seeking some monetary damages for everything that had that had happened to her. But I think it's also about um, a larger reckoning, a larger um, exploration of history, of trying to to tell the story as fully and honestly as we can as a country, um, as a way of of acknowledging the the uh, the damage is done. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough thing. I think even what, one of the things that struck me was in the second case, all of the chatter that was um, obviously um, present in the newspaper clippings from all across the United States, a lot of people thought that this was not the right time, that she had waited too long to seek reparations. And or it hadn't even been that long, right? And here we are, you know, um, centuries later, right? Because slavery began so early, 400 years ago. So mm -hmm. centuries later, we're here and we're having these conversations. And so many people want to say, well, that was in the past. It's not happening now. Why, why should we be held accountable? But I think the, um, you know, it's it, I think, as you rightly say, in your in your epilogue, even then it was they they had that same argument, there were so many people who wanted to just forget about it, they they felt like that they won, emancipation happened, states ratified, we're done, the story is over. Um, for me as someone and, uh, you know, as a historian, I think the present really presses on us in terms of the kinds of questions we ask about the past. You know, as Michelle de Certeau says, like every history is actually about the present. It's not really about what's happening in the past. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about like the current climate and I think reparations is certainly one, but as you talk about, it's the, the actual awareness Mm -hmm. and reckoning that we need to kind of come to. Um, and with that reckoning, I think, as we look at Ward's life is another point that we can draw on his life, his, his actions in a prison system, which <laughs> continues to plague mostly at people of African American descent till today, right? Mm -hmm. The vast majority of people in prison today continue to be of African American or, or African American mm -hmm. or of African mm -hmm. origin. Mm -hmm. So I want to kind of pivot and move towards um, the economics of the time mm -hmm. of Ward and um, where the exploitation of labor kind of comes into play, not mm -hmm. just slave labor, but, and, and, you know, in the book, you also talk about how she's leased out for work Right, so the person who owns a slave could even mortgage, like lease out someone, and, and 
actually benefit from this. But in the prison system, the amount of wealth he was able to, to gather, and we start seeing um, states that are privatizing, right? And he is a big, big factor in this as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe we could start talking more yeah. about Yeah, that's 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 so true. And and um by the time he died in, in the eighteen nineties, uh he left an estate to his children worth some six hundred thousand dollars. And so if we were to translate that into today's terms, he would have been a multimillionaire. Um and most of that money he had he had earned through um um running these state prisons um, in, in Kentucky and Tennessee and Arkansas. And especially after the Civil War, um, that's really the origins of the, the racial disparities that, that you were mentioning earlier in the prison system in the United States, because uh, after emancipation in many Southern states, white uh, politicians and planters devised new ways of exploiting the labor of formerly enslaved people. And they passed laws, for example, that that sentenced uh, those convicted of petty crimes, uh, stealing $5 worth of, of property, or even people who were really guilty of no crime at all, uh, but because of the color of their skin could be uh, arrested and then, and then subjected to a highly discriminatory judicial proceeding not unfamiliar to someone like Henrietta Wood from before the Civil War, and then find themselves in the state penitentiary, and yeah. then find themselves leased out to to private contractors on cotton or sugar plantations uh, to do the same kinds of work that they had been doing before, and then that would enrich the uh, the person who was leasing the prison system. And in the case of, of Tennessee and Arkansas, that was Ward. This wasn't confined, by the way, to those states. And, and in fact, here in Texas, um, in Houston, just outside the city in, in Sugarland, Texas, uh, many people in this area have, have recently been following the story of the Sugarland 95, uh, which are the uh, 95 uh, victims of the convict leasing system whose remains were discovered mm -hmm. on a piece of ground uh, owned by the, the Fort Bend Independent School District in, in Sugarland. And that sort of, I think, renewed some public attention to the history of convict leasing and uh, how close to us geographically it is here in, in, in Houston, but also how um, close to us in time this history is. I think, uh, as, you, as you noted, this isn't something that happened a long uh, time ago, even though that's often the way that, that that uh, white Americans in particular talk about the history of slavery. And, and as you note, as, that's how they were talking about it, even in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, you know, that this was uh, a, a, a distant chapter. It's time to move on. It's time to close that, that part of our history. But I was really struck in, in researching the book again and again by uh, the resonances and the echoes of the past and the present and really by how close uh, this story is to us, I had the, the, the privilege and honor of meeting one of Wood's uh, great, great granddaughters mm -hmm. uh, before she passed away in, in 2018. And you mentioned uh, earlier the name of Arthur Sims, who was Henrietta Wood's son, born in slavery in, in Mississippi after her kidnapping and, and re-enslavement. But he went on to a long life in Chicago and before he died, his great granddaughter, who I met, uh, lived in the same house with him until she was about seven years old when he passed. And so when I was able to, to speak with her in, in her home in Oakland, here I was talking to someone who had living memories of Henrietta Wood's son. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that really uh, exemplifies and illustrates how close in time this history was to us. Uh, yeah. It's not something that that was distant, and so it's not. It's, it should not be shocking to us that the consequences of of systems like convict leasing, uh, systems like slavery, continue to um, to exert an impact on on the structures of our society, uh, and and require us to think hard about how to to root out the 
the legacies of, of slavery and, and convict leasing from our, our present day institutions, our present day policies. Right. Yeah. So in the second case, um, she wins a little bit over 10% of what she asks for is $2,500. Mm -hmm. And that you say probably allowed um, Arthur Sims to purchase his first home in Chicago. And I think what was nice about this story was not only showing what could happen to a family if reparations had been made at that time, but that reparations in itself is actually still not enough, right? Because eventually the house that he buys is still redlined. So the value of that housing market where he purchased a home and other people of color purchased homes actually doesn't inflate, as, like the value of the property doesn't go up as much as it would have if it was an all white neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. I think even today there are these studies that show that homes that are appraised that are black owned home versus white home, white owned homes, even if they're in the same you know, zone, Mm -hmm. are appraised at a much lower value than they are, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, the reparations certainly helped this family. And yes, they were able to live what we would call a middle-class life. Mm -hmm. But hitting, crossing that threshold still, you know, there were other structural things in place that mm -hmm. prevented um, this family from progressing even further, right? Yeah, I um, think that's a good point. And, and in debates about reparations, uh, when you hear some people say, as you, as you alluded to earlier, that, oh, well, that happened a long time ago, or, you know, I, I never um, owned, owned slaves myself, or my family never did. I think that sort of um, way of thinking fixes the conversation on the history of slavery, when, as you point out, there, were, there was Jim Crow segregation after the Civil War. There were um, policies like redlining, so uh, housing discrimination, um, uh, you know, differences in the way that the federal government awarded mortgages and appraised property in the 20th century. Um, when I first learned about Wood's story in 2014, that was the year that ta Coates published a, an award-winning magazine article, The Case for Reparations, that I think um, is, is really worth reading if, if anyone in the audience hasn't. And it, it explores some of the history of redlining and some of the the um, impacts of, of uh, racism even beyond uh, the end of slavery. And, and so claims about reparations today are, are not just talking about 19th century slavery, but also about all of the things that, that followed in its wake. Um, and so I, I do think that you're right that um, it is kind of hard to decide in some ways at, at the end of, of, of researching this how to, uh, how to regard this $2,500 that, that she won because uh, on the one hand, it does seem hardly sufficient to, to cover all of the things that, that she had endured, uh, all the things that she had suffered. And, and it wasn't even as, as much as she had herself demanded in this lawsuit. Um, on the other hand, I think her story shows that even a small amount of, of restitution could make a big difference uh, in, in the life of a family particularly because it was invested in, in a house and real estate, you know, that could, uh, could become a real source of wealth that could, that could uh, empower upward economic mobility for Arthur Sims and, and his descendants. And so, um, you know, I think sometimes we get caught up in thinking about reparations today with questions about, well, how much would, would reparations be or who would, who would be paid and, and how much would be enough uh, and I think sometimes that distracts us from the possibility that even even a small amount mm -hmm. um, could could be very impactful. Uh, and I think especially if it were paired with uh, a, a reckoning of the kind that we were talking about earlier, a, an acknowledgement and a full airing of of what's happened, so that it would be meaningful and and would be more than just a sort of a token payment, but actually it would be paired with um, uh, a real acknowledgement of 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 what happened in our history, um, you know that that that's a powerful possibility to to contemplate and, and think about. But I think you're right that in in her case, it's hard to 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 really um, close the book on on her own experience and and say you know she she won reparations. You know I very self consciously 
use the word restitution in the, in the subtitle of the book, uh, even though initially I was thinking about this as a case of reparations mm -hmm. uh, over time and doing the research about the book and thinking about the, the history of her family, I, I started to rethink that uh, choice and in and, and large part too, because um, even though, as I said earlier, there's interviews that Wood gave, there's a lot that, that we have to, to get some insight into her story. It's also true that her last interview that she gave in 1879 was published before she had even received the money from Zebulon Ward. Uh, and after that interview, she doesn't appear, as far as I can tell, in the historical record again. And so if, if we we're wondering the question of, well, did, uh, did that restitution amount to reparations? Uh, did it really redress Mm -hmm. what she had suffered. Uh, before I answer that question myself, I would want to know how she um, would have answered that question. And unfortunately, that's another example of the silence in the archive. Uh, we don't know how she regarded um, her victory and, and whether she viewed it as sufficient repair uh, for, for, for what she had endured. And so uh, I think you're right to say uh, it's kind of hard to to conclude definitively uh, that that this was enough. Um, what what she won, even though at the same time it's it's significant that she won. You know, it's rare to 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 find a formerly enslaved person to receive even this amount of of justice in, in the courts. And so I don't want to diminish either yeah. uh, the real. Um, uh, extraordinary nature of what she did achieve. And as I said earlier, the implications that even that small amount had for her family. Uh, but hopefully, you know, readers of the book will will ponder with me uh, how to how to regard this, uh, this final victory. Yeah, I mean, it, it begs the question, how many Henrietta Woods were there? How many were persistent like her, fighting like her? And how many of those case files have been misplaced the ways the way mm -hmm. hers was right? Like in mm -hmm. the epilogue, you you describe you know as, as any historian could you know empathize and and has experienced something like this where you're waiting impatiently for a file and if it's not found, how devastating it would be mm -hmm. on someone's work. Um, but thinking about how many Henrietta mm -hmm. Woods were there that would have had a legitimate claim and could have also benefited. And even there, again, we have silences, right? We don't know. There's a precarity to even the, the, the um, documents that preserve this. And I was wondering about precedent, right? So you say sh she was the, um, it was probably the earliest where we find that, mm -hmm. uh, that the award that she sought was actually given to mm -hmm. her, even the appeals agreed with the, the decision mm -hmm. that the jury made. Um, how many times do you think, mm -hmm. or I'm not sure if this is something you've looked into, was mm -hmm. her case used as precedent in the, you know, afterwards? Mm -hmm. How many times did she, um, how many times was it used? And the other thing that I want to kind of explore is like, when we talk about um, an unevenness of justice or unevenness of even what it means to be slave, the state lines, mm -hmm. the, the going down south across river, every time you cross a river, mm -hmm. it seems to get worse and worse, you know, even in terms of fear and, and rumor, mm -hmm. you know, if you get sold down river, it, it, it's worse. And when emancipation happens, then they move west towards Texas, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of unevenness in the states and the state laws and what it means to be a free person or an enslaved person, it could change. If you come to Ohio, it's possible you could be seen as a freed person, right? And mm -hmm. after emancipation, even more so. So I wanna kind of talk about how do, you, how do you as a historian go, you know, there's so many different archives, there's so many different courts, they get moved around. This case that was tried in one state, the files are actually in a different state now. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do you kind of piece this together? And in your search, did you find other cases like Henrietta Woods? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, to answer that last question first, I had a lot of help from uh, dedicated archivists and librarians who work hard to, to try to preserve these documents and make them available to, to researchers. And so, uh, you know, it's a credit to, to many libraries and, and, you know, academic institutions, state archives, um, you know, we really need to support those kinds of, of organizations. 
in order to find stories like like Woods. Uh, I think a lot of there's a lot of talk sometimes these days about e erasing history or uh, you know re retelling our past, but I think the real way to erase history is to to not fund um, archives that that preserve these kinds of sources. Uh, and so that's that's really a critical uh, tool for historians like myself. Um, and it, it's challenging in, for some of the same reasons that it's it was challenging for Wood in, in the antebellum period because of the, the federal structure of, of the US government. The fact that we have you know, federal laws, but also uh, 50 states now and, and fewer then of course, but each state with its own code and its own laws uh, and, and that had a direct impact on the kinds of justice that she was able to seek uh, in in the antebellum period, and I think it limited the the weight that her case had as precedent uh, for, mm -hmm. for other suits as well. Um, even though her case was heard in a federal court, it began in a state court, and the the reason she was able to sue initially was partly because she had been free and could argue that she had been wrongfully re-enslaved, that she had been kidnapped. Um, but absent that that um, that first moment, uh, she might not have had the legal standing to bring this suit. You know, she made clear in in the lawsuit that she thought of it as a, a suit about slavery itself, not just about the kidnapping. But the vast majority of enslaved people who who found themselves uh, legally freed at the end of the Civil War had not had an experience like hers of obtaining freedom and then having it taken away while slavery was still legal. And so her case was unique in that way. And I don't rule out the possibility that other cases like hers might be found by historians digging into the archives and, and waiting in those reading rooms for the file to, to come back. But uh, I think the, the commentary from the newspapers at the time made clear that many contemporaries realized what an extraordinary case it was and how remarkable it was that everything had sort of happened just right, uh, even to enable her to return to the scene of the crime, as it were, to find Ward, to file this suit, to have lawyers who would make the arguments and stick with it. Um, and so in that sense, her case was was very rare uh, and unique in ways that limited its ability to to serve as a precedent later. Um, so today, I think many advocates of reparations are are rightly concentrating more on, on legislation uh, at the federal level and uh, seeking some solution that could, that could transcend state lines uh, and also that could um, put it on a, a more secure footing than, mm -hmm. uh, than the kind of litigation that, that Wood was engaged in uh, in the 1870s. Yeah. So I guess we have time for one final question. Um, what's next for you? What's your next, what are you working on now? Well, right now I'm climbing a very steep learning curve as uh, chair of my department here at Rice. And of course, uh, all of us in higher education are, are dealing with all of the disruption as, as everyone else is from uh, the pandemic. And uh, so that's that's occupying a lot of my time. I'm also here at Rice uh, co-chairing a task force on slavery, segregation, and racial injustice, which is an effort by the university to reckon with our own past and and to look into the entanglements of our history with slavery segregation and racial injustice so those are the things that are, are occupying most of my time uh right now i was secretly hoping you were gonna write a like a epilogue or like a second book but focusing on arthur sims i found him to be so fascinating i you know just his involvement in community matters, but also as being a very long, you know, like his, he practiced as a lawyer for so many years. I think there's so much to be said and about him, his life, the time period, having been the son, enslaved himself, but also freed, you know, well, if you I, know your graduate students will pursue it. If I, if I do, I'll, I'll be sure to, to credit you for the idea. So thank you for that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time. Your book was a pleasure to read. For those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet, please read it. It's called Sweet Taste of Liberty by Caleb McDaniel. Thank you so much and back to you. Thank you, Dr. McDaniel, for a truly insightful discussion. Having the opportunity to get your insight on the issues highlighted in your book has been extremely valuable. 
on behalf of the Ismaili Jamath Kana'an Center. We also want to thank each and every one of you, our participants, that joined virtually from across the United States and abroad. We hope that you found the program to be as valuable as we did. To get more information about the Ismaili Jamath Kana'an Center, please go to the.ismaili in your web browser for more information on upcoming programming, please go to facebook.com slash the Ismaili USA. We look forward to sharing future programming with you. Thank you.